Hello. Oh, good to see you. Nice to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Wow. Well, thanks Thank for, you very much. Yeah, th thanks for joining us today. That uh, looks like we have a pretty good audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. No, we have a great pleasure to have you as well. So I well, look forward to uh, talking about what is uh, the memory stuffing. It's very exciting. Thanks. <clears throat> So I guess uh, uh well thanks Jung as well. That's I think Jung have already tried uh, uh with with you already, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Perfect. So I heard from him that uh, he joined your department uh, about one year ago. Yeah, yeah, no, right. Right. That's, uh, yeah. 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 he did great. That uh, he did all these got all these achievements. So we're so glad to have him on board. <laughs> How many faculty members do you have now? Uh, right, right now we have around like uh, thirty something. That's uh, we, we, oh. yeah, we, we are still hiring, in fact. So if you have any oh. good candidate to recommend us, uh, feel free. That's uh, we're happy to 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 explore that one. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So you 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 know also and our colleagues are uh, uh, Dr. Li, Li Chan. I'm sure that's uh, <laughs> they, we know each other. <laughs> yeah, he's okay. also a good friend of mine. Yeah, sure. I'm sure you guys know each other. That's good, right? Yeah, yeah. Tony really and uh, and uh, and uh, Dr. Li are all we met in Amherst. Oh, <laughs> together, right at yeah. the bar <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah. Right. So we are all young stars in in this community yeah yep, sure that's uh, all these rising stars so so glad to have you all that's you're our role model <laughs> yes <laughs> so i think it's about time it's 3 p.m now so i think that's uh, maybe we can kind of uh, start uh, uh, the introduction first so i know we all know uh, dr yang uh, professor yang so, so well but i think still a short an introduction about him to keep it brief to such that we can save more time for his uh, uh, presentation. So uh, Professor Yang has been served as a uh, director of the Center for Brain Inspired Chips at the Peking University and the executive director of the Center for Brain Inspired uh, Intelligence at the Chinese Institute for the Brain Science. So his research interests include a very wide range of work and that's our memory stern, neuromorphic computing, and also the in-memory computing. And he has published over 100 papers in high profile journal like conference including like nature electronics, nature communication, nature nanotechnology, science events, and advanced material, nano letter, and many, many other. As well as uh, five book chapters, and uh, his paper has been cited for more than uh, 5,000 and 500 times at the uh, each index for over like 33. And uh, he also was invited to give uh, over like 30 uh, keynotes, uh, invited talks on international conference and to serve as a uh, TPC chair for uh, the member for many uh, international conference. So uh, Professor Yang, was also serve as an associate editor for the nano selected and the editorial board member of chief scientific reports and the science uh, china information science as well yeah, and he has been also invited to uh, be a guest editor for three special issues and uh, for the new and also wait, uh, wrote uh, 12 news and the news and also a member for IEEE, MRS and RSC and uh, many other awards so I just keep it brief and uh, definitely there's also been the MIT technology review innovator uh, verified in China and also explore uh, price so without further ado that's uh, so Professor Yang is uh, going to share with us today about the memory sticks dynamic space uh, hardware primitives for efficient computing so let's welcome Professor Yang for joining us today thank you Professor Yang Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Professor Wang. Uh, so now I, I can share my screen, yes. uh, but maybe I need your permission to do so. Yes. Okay, now I think sure. it's fine. Uh, can you see my slide now? It's perfect. Okay, okay. So once again, thank you very much, Professor Wang, for the kind introduction. And uh, also I want to thank uh, Zhong Rui for inviting me and uh, giving me this opportunity to, to uh, uh, share my uh, research and uh, recent thoughts on uh, some uh, hardware uh, primitives uh, for efficient computing applications. So this is uh, uh, based on memory stores, especially by uh, utilizing the uh, intrinsic dynamics in memory stores. So hopefully I can show a few uh, examples on this today. Um, so once again, I'm Yu Chao Yang uh, from Peking University. And I, I want to split my um, uh, talk today into a few uh, uh, sections. First, I want to uh, briefly talk about the requirement for an architecture shift uh, in the AI and the post more era. Then I want to go into uh, some uh, fundamental aspects about the uh, intrinsic dynamics in memory steel devices because I believe this is a physical basis for 
uh, many um, computing design and computing systems. Um, following this direction, I want to show a few examples. So this includes um, uh, both niobium oxide and the vanadium oxide minister based uh, spiking neurons with uh, spatial temporal dynamics, and also um, artificial synaptic devices with uh, spatial temporal dynamics. Um, this dynamics is an uh, important mechanism for uh, efficient computing. And uh, I also want to show that uh, um, some nonlinear dynamics like uh, chaos uh, can also be um, used uh, for computing, for example, uh, to build a system for the efficient solution of uh, optimization problems. So in addition to this uh, spatial temporal and, uh, and the nonlinear dynamics, the intrinsic stochasticity of memory store can be used for computing as well. For example, uh, to achieve uh, uncertainty quantification and uh, acceleration of the training process. So finally, I will uh, briefly talk about our recent effort in, in the design and the tape out of uh, in-memory computing chips based on memory store and give a conclusion. So uh, this is uh, uh, basically uh, what the uh, story uh, starts from. Uh, because the uh, present digital computer use a uh, so-called von Neumann architecture, where the processor and the memory are physically separated from each other. Uh, this is actually uh, a significant step and uh, a very important invention in the history of computer because it al allows the uh, uh, development of a general purpose uh, computing architecture. But uh, since the application has evolved very quickly and, uh, and dramatically in recent years, um, some limitation has um, emerged. For example, uh, due to this um, architecture, uh, the expensive energy and latency are actually consumed in moving the data rather than computing the data. For example, about 70% of the energy is consumed in data movement at 10 nanometer uh, CMOS according to Intel. So this um, actually asked for uh, a shift in the computing architecture, especially for uh, AI applications and uh, many other applications involving a uh, big amount of data. So one of the uh, promising architectures is to directly uh, merge computation with in-memory, uh, so-called in-memory computing or, or, or SIM. Uh, this has been showcased in some uh, specific cases, for example, the acceleration of uh, vector matrix multiplication in uh, neural network uh, uh, computing. Uh, and this is used to uh, build some uh, AI accelerators. And beyond this, um, there is also a lot of effort in developing neuromorphic computing architecture, which I think uh, represents a more radical shift in the uh, uh, architecture design, uh, because this is uh, aimed to uh, get inspiration from the principle and the architecture of the human brain. So it holds a great prospect in, in building artificial general intelligence so both in-memory computing and uh, neuromorphic computing um, have a big potential in achieving low power uh, computing and uh, high energy efficiency, which is very important for, for many uh, application scenarios because, uh, um, because the cloud applications and the data centers uh, place more importance in high throughput and high uh, computing precision. Uh, without um, strict requirement on, on power or energy efficiency. So in this regard, uh, um, the GPU is dominant in this market, but as it moves to the edge, like in mobile and variable devices, the uh, energy efficiency becomes more and more important uh, since the energy supply in such cases is very limited. So uh, in this sense, um, the in-memory computing and other emerging uh, computing architecture um, become important in in this uh, regard. So the basic principle of in-memory computing um, is actually the physic, uh, physical acceleration of uh, some operators. A typical example is a vector matrix multiplication uh, based on Ohm's law and the Kirchhoff's current law, taking uh, resistive uh, uh, devices as an example. But in fact, uh, this uh, in-memory computing architecture can be pulled uh, based on different type of devices. So this can be done either by uh, chart-based devices, including uh, SRAM, DRAM, and Flash, uh, which are more uh, mature device technologies, and also by resistance-based devices, 
um, which is more related to the uh, my talk today. Uh, this includes different type of uh, uh, memory stores, uh, such as uh, RAM, piece RAM, and flash. And uh, recently, there is also a lot of interest in ferry electric fight devices, but they are all based on uh, a, a similar principle that is a physical acceleration of, uh, of the um, vector matrix modifications. Um, a majority of the present effort is to, is to do efficient inference, um, while only a, a small part of the effort is, uh, is to study training uh, acceleration. The point is that um, the requirement for device performance is very different for inference and training applications. So to do inference, it usually requires um, high weight precision to guarantee the network performance, uh, de depending on the uh, network model. The long retention, because uh, uh, it needs to storage the weight matrix within the device array. A low read energy, because uh, uh, doing inference is generally performing read on the device crossbar, so that uh, uh, it also decides the um, overall or the ultimate energy uh, efficiency of the computing and also dev low device variation to allow high parallelism. But to do, to do training, it is actually much more demanding. It also asks for high linearity and sym symmetry when modulating the state of the device. Um, this is ideally to achieve a open loop uh, programming or updating process. Um, this is a uh, uh, without any uh, verification process. Of course, this is an uh, ideal case. Uh, it also asks for high endurance because uh, the device need to be updated much more frequently than doing inference. Um, also due to the same reason, it need to be written very fast with low programming energy. So the training is much more difficult than inference, but in many cases, this is also required uh, from an uh, application uh, perspective. So another point, uh, uh, that is also very important is uh, about the integration technology. Uh, to support big um, and uh, advanced AI models, um, the on-chip memory capacity needs to be as big, and as big as possible. So flash almost uh, stops scaling uh, right now uh, at about 28 nanometer. It is very difficult and expensive to develop a new generation of uh, flash te technology. But in this sense, uh, memory stores are very promising um, and uh, uh, different types of uh, memory stores have uh, all reached a 20 or 22 nanometer uh, technology node, including a 22 nanometer uh, RAM at the TSMC, a 20 nanometer PCM at Intel, and also a 22 nanometer uh, MRAM at the Global Foundry. So um, it also have a um, potential to, do, to go more advanced technology node so that uh, the uh, memory store is also promising uh, in terms of integration technology. So uh, overall, the acceleration of um, uh, neural network computing is uh, mainly based on the um, non-volatile and uh, sometimes analog contact and states of memory stores. But uh, mm, this is, uh, uh, I think this is only um, uh, part of the story and uh, this can only accelerate uh, some of the operators. So in this case, the memory store is actually treated uh, as a programmable resistor. But uh, the memory store, um, what sets um, the memory store differently from uh, a programmable resistor is that uh, it has richer dynamics. So this is um, uh, what, why I want to uh, spend a few minutes uh, talking about uh, uh, these intrinsic dynamics in memory store devices. So the memory store can be defined by a very simple uh, set of equations. So the first equation is actually a state-dependent Ohm's law. So it seems to be a Ohm's law, uh, same with uh, a resistor. But uh, the uh, state of the memory store is not uh, directly decided by the instantaneous inputs. Um, but uh, this is decided by an internal state variable or a set of uh, internal state variables. So it is actually the change rate of the state variable uh, directly uh, decided by the instantaneous inputs. So this is a, a fundamental reason why the memory register has a memory effect, because in order to get to the state, we have to perform a time integral over the uh, inputs and uh, get the, the, the actual uh, state of the memory register, the present state. Uh, and also it accounts for the rich dynamics in this, set, uh, this type of devices, because uh, uh, 
uh, depending on the detailed form of the state variable, for example, the size of the conducting filament, or also the number of the state variables, we can have more than one uh, state variable within the memory receiver devices so that it can uh, lead to different uh, orders of uh, complexity and uh, actually has potential to let memory register function as a very complicated uh, uh, electronic circuit. So based on this um, uh, simple yet very, very uh, meaningful uh, set of equations, we can have a different type of memory registers. In fact, the different forms of number tell memories like uh, RAM, PCRAM, and MRAM are different embodiments of the memory registered devices. They all can be described by this simple equation, but the, the form and the dynamics in different devices are, are dependent on their physical processes. So uh, the dynamics in these memory registers can also be directly uh, characterized and understood from a physical perspective. For example, there are uh, two major types of um, uh, memory registers uh, or two major types of uh, RAM devices. So one is based on metal ion transport and the filament growth. The other based on uh, oxygen ion uh, transport and filament growth. So the first type is also called a CB RAM. So the dynamics in uh, CB RAM devices can be well understood by in situ TEM observation, which allows us to directly see the uh, uh, filament growth dynamics um, during the set process and uh, also the reverse process, that is a uh, filament dissolution during uh, the reset process. So we can see that this actually has a lot of uh, dynamic uh, physical chemical processes and uh, including the fully and the partially growth filaments and also uh, depending on the detailed dynamic conditions and the material systems uh, uh, related to the uh, memory register, it can, different, uh, can have a different filament growth modes. Uh, the major uh, dynamic parameters including the ion mobility evidence showing that uh, this type of devices can be uh, very rich in, uh, in, in terms of dynamics. So um, similar uh, case uh, exists in uh, oxygen ion based memory stars. So the uh, ion migration and the filament growth dynamics in uh, oxide memory stars can also be uh, directly uh, characterized, for example, by scanning probe microscopy. So, uh, without going to uh, too many details, we can Professor uh, Jiang. Uh, well, it looks like it's a bad uh, connection. Uh, maybe we can ask uh, Professor Yang to kind of switch off the video if that helps. So, Zhong Yue, can you check with him like uh, through the. Uh, oh, sure, the... sure. Yeah, I will check oh, with Professor. Looks like Professor Yang is still here. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, I, I thought. Yeah. Oh, hi, yes. Professor. Okay. Oh. Well, I think it's a bad reception before. Maybe uh, if you want, if, maybe you can switch off the video if that helps a little bit. Okay, you, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Now I will uh, switch off and uh, uh, share I don't know you, which slide uh, was I uh, talking about. Um, oh, no, we didn't miss much. Oh. I think only one slide or so. So you can just go back. I've helped with okay. PS1. PS1. Here? Yeah, okay. this one. Yes. This one? Oh, yeah, that, that one. So end of this one. Yes, correct. This one. Okay. Yeah, correct. Okay. All right, all right. Sorry about this. Uh, there is um, maybe some uh, bad internet uh, connection. So, okay. So similar with uh, uh, metal ion based uh, memory steel devices, um, the um, uh, oxide based uh, memory stars also have uh, similar dynamics, including uh, both ion migration and uh, filament growth and dissolution, uh, which can uh, can be characterized by by uh, like a scanning probe microscopy and other techniques uh, without going to too many details, uh, this is uh, just experimental evidence showing that uh, this type of devices can be um, including uh, rich and uh, uh, 
and uh, very complex uh, dynamics, uh, which is a, a physical resource for uh, designing computing applications upon uh, this type of devices. So uh, today I will um, uh, select um, uh, three examples uh, for further discussion. One is a uh, spatial temporal dynamics. Uh, the second one is a uh, nonlinear dynamics and uh, uh, um, also uh, intrinsic uh, stochasticity uh, in memory steel devices. Um, I will uh, show hopefully um, one or a few examples uh, um, on the uh, computing applications based on uh, these uh, dynamic uh, characteristics of uh, memory stars. So first is about uh, the uh, spatial temporal dynamics. This is an indispensable uh, mechanism in many uh, uh, somewhat uh, complicated uh, computing uh, application uh, like uh, the motion detection, uh, the uh, object tracking and so on and so forth. So here we can uh, clear, clearly tell the motion from the lower left image um, containing only about 10 pixels. Uh, this is far from a high resolution image, but um, we can get uh, somewhat uh, very detailed uh, information from this because uh, each pixel contains uh, rich temporal information. So this shows the advantage of uh, uh, spatial temporal uh, dynamics. So we um, build an artificial neural circuit uh, with uh, 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 spatial temporal dynamics. This is based on the obium oxide memory stir, which is a type of a volatile memory stir. Uh, this memory stir is um, connected in parallel with a capacitor uh, and in turn in series with a resistor. So such a capacitor can integrate input signals and uh, accumulate a charge over the capacitor. And once the uh, voltage exceeds the threshold voltage of the memory stir, then it can set the device to on state. And the on state of the device discharges the capacitor. So overall, it forms an electrical spike and the similar with a biological neuron. So the spiking rate is a, a function, can be a function of uh, uh, both electrical inputs and also the circuit parameters. But the important, uh, an important mechanism is that uh, um, during the interval between the uh, spiking durations, so the, during the spiking durations, the, the capacitor is accumulating charge, but during the intervals, it can actually, uh, the, the charge over the capacitor can gradually leak through the off state of the memory star. So which is actually a physical process, uh, a physical process uh, related to, to timing. So this provides a physical mechanism for uh, a time related information processing. Um, here we can see that the spiking rate is also dependent on the power interval. So based on this mechanism, this neuron circuit can integrate signals not only from uh, different spatial locations, but also uh, signals with different, type, uh, with different timing or uh, phase characteristics. So overall, it has a spatial temporal integration capability. So based on this uh, spatial temporal dynamics, uh, they can uh, perform uh, uh, efficient coincidence detection um, between uh, these uh, spike sequences fed from uh, different synapses. Uh, so we can get high firing rate when uh, coincident spike trains are transmitted. So this is uh, uh, simply based on the, the, the temporal dynamics of the artificial neuron. Um, but there is a problem with uh, regard to the niobium oxide memory star or niobium oxide neuron, because uh, uh, this material has a polycrystalline structure so the green structure within each device can be different uh, so that it causes variation from one device to another. Uh, recently, we have uh, collaborated with a uh, material growth scientist uh, and uh, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we were able to get a single crystalline vanadium oxide based on memory star. So uh, this is based on a pulse laser deposition and uh, uh, this um, single crystalline material can actually eliminate the green structure and uh, uh, dramatically improve the uniformity of the device so that we can see this uh, vanadium oxide memory star has excellent uh, cycle to cycle and the device to device uniformity. So this is uh, 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 attributed to the uh, elimination of the green boundaries and uh, uh, enhancement of the uh, material quality. So Based on this uh, vanadium oxide memory stir, we can uh, further uh, improve the 
uh, performance of the artificial neuron circuit. So once we uh, incorporate the uh, vanadium oxide memristor into the uh, artificial neuron. So here, once again, we can see that uh, this uh, single crystalline based uh, uh, vanadium oxide memristor can uh, allow the uh, uh, artificial neuron to have an excellent response, once again, both to electrical inputs and also to electrical uh, uh, to, to circuit parameters. And uh, the uniformity uh, can be seen from the spiking behavior because each spike is almost identical uh, with other spikes. So this is uh, due to the uh, improvement of the material quality itself. Uh, um, so here in an artificial neural circuit, the uh, load resistor is fixed. So this is used to tune the uh, uh, artificial, uh, it, is, it, it is able to uh, tune the spiking rate and the spiking behavior. But once we replace this uh, fixed load resistor with a sensor, then we are able to directly uh, convert the uh, uh, real world signals, the sensory signals uh, to the spiking rate of the neuron itself. Uh, say uh, there is only one uh, requirement for the sensor. So the sensor has to give a, a resistance output instead of uh, other forms of uh, output like a capacitance. So as long as we can have sensors that uh, gives out uh, resistance based output and we use a sensor to replace a load resistor, then we can build a very simple uh, sensory neuron circuit that can directly talk and interact with the real physical world and convert physical quantities directly into the spiking behavior of the neuron circuit. So um, as an example, we have um, prepared a pressure sensor based on aerogeographene. So this is a very simple and a very popular pressure sensor that can convert due to the structure of the graphene, it can convert a different uh, uh, amplitude of the pressure into the resistance. And this resistance in turn leads to the different spiking uh, frequencies. So overall, we can get a pressure-based uh, uh, sensory neuron. Similarly, we have uh, uh, implemented uh, this sensory neuron that can convert uh, pressure-based, light-based, and temperature-based uh, uh, sensory signals. So in this way, we can actually avoid uh, the uh, uh, very uh, hardware costly ADC uh, that uh, uh, serves as an interface between conventional sensors, sensors and the digital circuits and uh, dramatically uh, enhance the efficiency of the, uh, this uh, uh, hardware uh, sensory neuron. So this is uh, once again based uh, as a single crystalline vanadium oxide and the uh, sensory neuron shows uh, excellent uniformity. So with, uh, based on these sensory neurons, we can actually further build a perception system. So we, uh, what we did is that we uh, uh, prepared uh, five different uh, sensory neurons that can uh, convert the curvature signals into the uh, spiking behavior. And we attach each of these uh, sensory neurons into a finger. So overall, we have uh, five um, sensory neurons attached to five fingers and uh, different gestures uh, can actually be encoded to the spiking behavior related to each finger, uh, which allows us to actually distinguish the, uh, very well the, the gestures uh, that is uh, uh, made by the, by the fingers. So this is a, a very uh, a simple uh, demonstration, but this is a, a actually a, a simple and efficient uh, uh, hardware demonstration of a, a spike-based uh, perception system that is, uh, once again, uh, take advantage of the, this uh, sensory neuron. So uh, this is about the, the application of uh, uh, neurons with uh, spatial temporal dynamics. But actually, synaptic devices can also have uh, spatial temporal dynamics. So the temporal uh, characteristic in synapse is uh, manifested as uh, a synaptic plasticity or memory uh, with uh, uh, with uh, short-term plasticity or, or short-term memory. So uh, this can be achieved by uh, uh, ion-gated uh, uh, synaptic transistor. So the ionic gating is uh, uh, also an important uh, mechanism, uh, sometimes called electrochemical gating. So this is, uh, uh, this is another dimension to tune uh, the device behavior, uh, uh, usually at equilibrium. 
So this ionic gating effect can induce many physical processes. For example, it can uh, cause electronic uh, uh, double layer effect uh, and also ion adsorption, uh, ion intercalation, and even phase transition. So this can induce a, a variety of uh, physical chemical processes, which in turn can, can change the uh, behavior of the device itself. So here, uh, the ionic gating effect in our device includes uh, two stage of uh, ion interaction. So one is uh, ion adsorption uh, at the surface of the channel material uh, usually happens uh, when a weak or few uh, electrical signals are applied. And uh, once we apply a strong or a large number of uh, electrical signals, then uh, there will be uh, ion intercalation uh, into the uh, interlayer position of the channel materials. So based on this two, uh, two stage of uh, uh, ion uh, gating effect, we can have short, both short-term and long-term memory effect that uh, is actually the temporal and tunable temporal scale uh, related to these uh, synaptic devices. So recently we have also achieved this uh, tunable temporal dynamics in, uh, in, uh, in uh, another uh, uh, synaptic devices based on uh, ferroelectric uh, indium selenide. So indium selenide, I found it is a very interesting material, um, which mainly uh, includes two types of uh, uh, important properties. The first one is uh, uh, it is a very electrical material, and uh, it has a spontaneous both uh, out of plane and also in plane polarizations. So these two types of uh, polarizations have a dipole locking effect, which means uh, they change simultaneously, they lock with each other. So the second uh, uh, property is, uh, is that uh, this indium selenide is an uh, excellent uh, optoelectronic uh, material which can generate uh, uh, photo-induced carriers in response to optical inputs. So uh, overall, we build a federal electrical memory store based on uh, indium selenide. So this allows the uh, device itself to firstly show tunable temporal uh, uh, dynamics to, get, uh, to have uh, this short-term memory when electrical inputs are uh, applied on the device. So this is uh, due to the switching of the ferroelectric polarization. But the switching uh, of the ferroelectric polarization can be gradually relaxed over time. Looks like it's a, it's a bad connection again. So let's see, uh, Professor Yang is still here. Okay. So, Can you hear me? Yes, now it's okay. That's, I don't know, uh, it's, uh, my, my internet connection is unstable or somewhere is un unstable. Uh, yeah, host, huh? This has been enabled. Sorry, I think. Sorry about this. No, no worry, that's uh So I think it's uh yeah, I think we probably can try it again. That looks like now it's okay. Okay. Yep, sorry, so, that's uh, I think I we have to here. Yes, 28. Mm -hmm. Which slide uh was I, I uh, talking think, about? I think it's 28, is that right? 28, this one. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. So we seem to have a lot of problem today, <laughs> which is very unlucky. Okay. Yep, sorry, but th thanks for effort. Thanks. Okay, okay. Yep. So uh, so, okay, uh, to be short, uh, we can uh, have uh, uh, electrical synapse based on uh, indium selenide uh, with short-term memory. This is due to the switching and uh, subsequent relaxation of the ferroelectric uh, polarization within this material. Um, and once again, the time scale of the device can be tuned by uh, electrical inputs similar with uh, uh, ion-gated uh, uh, synapses. But, uh, uh, more interestingly, uh, in this material, at the same time, we can uh, have a tunable uh, temporal dynamics uh, in response to optical inputs. So this is due to the uh, photo-generated carriers, which uh, temporarily increase the photo conduction, and uh, um, they will be um, annihilated uh, quickly, but some of the um, uh, carriers will be um, 
will be uh, feeding uh, some slow traps uh, within the material. So this is uh, uh, manifested as uh, the time uh, tunable uh, uh, time scale in response to both the light intensity and also the, uh, the pulse uh, duration, the optical pulse du duration. So this actually offers two dimensions to, to tune the uh, temporal uh, dynamics within the memory store. One is um, electrical um, approach, uh, which is based on the ferroelectric polarization. Of course, it's a reversible ferroelectric polarization. The second mechanism and approach is um, based on the optoelectronic uh, property, which is uh, um, a totally different physical mechanism, but it, it offers another dimension to tune the temporal dynamics. So with the coexistence of uh, two distinct mechanisms within this material, we can uh, actually uh, do uh, efficient computing. So one of the um, uh, applications of uh, the temporal dynamics in computing is to use it as a reservoir uh, in a reservoir computing system, which is essentially a, a feature extraction layer. And uh, this feature extraction layer uh, does not need, need to be trained. It can be connected with a readout layer that uh, uh, can perform classification of uh, inputs after training. So uh, in this case, the reservoir of the, uh, uh, the computing system is essential uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the application. And um, previous demonstrations uh, of the reservoir can be uh, constructed by devices with uh, uh, short-term uh, plasticity. But since here we have uh, two physical dimensions to tune the short-term dynamics, we can uh, actually perform a mixed signal uh, reservoir computing that uh, can directly uh, interact with uh, a multi-mode uh, uh, sensory data. Say one is related to the electrical input. Um, uh, this electrical input can be actually any form of uh, uh, sensory data that convert uh, physical quantities into electrical signals. The other, uh, say it can be uh, directly an optical sensor. So the point is that uh, with the uh, expansion or with this uh, of the reservoir or uh, with this uh, existence of the multi-mode uh, reservoir, it can actually, because the quality of the reservoir computing largely relies on the, uh, the nonlinear transformation that happens within this uh, uh, reservoir layer. So with this multi-mode uh, reservoir, um, physical reservoir in the computing system, it is able to improve the computing um, accuracy and performance. So we have experimentally testified this idea. So we, we can encode the input information into a mixed train of uh, uh, signals, including both voltage pulses and uh, optical pulses. And uh, actually the mixture mode of the uh, uh, both types of pulses can actually affect the, let's say, quality of the reservoir. And this in turn affect the uh, uh, eventual performance of the reservoir computing system. Compared with the uh, reservoir using only electrical inputs here by using a mixed signal uh, reservoir encoding um, in the computing system, we can enhance the uh, uh, classification accuracy from, uh, from about 89% uh, uh, to about 99% by, uh, by uh, 10%. So this task is, uh, uh, I think, is a, is a, is a uh, demonstration of the uh, advantage of uh, uh, spatial temporal dynamics once again for uh, computing applications. So uh, in addition to this uh, spatial temporal dynamics, we can actually utilize uh, other forms of dynamics for computing, let's say nonlinear dynamics. Um, a typical form of nonlinear dynamics in memory store is uh, actually chaos. So a recent study on neuroscience shows that uh, our brain also operates at the edge of a chaos, which is an important mechanism for us to quickly switch between different cognitive states. So this is, uh, uh, of course, from, from neuroscience, but uh, I think it represents some fundamental principle in information processing. So we uh, 
have tried to incorporate chaos into the solution of uh, optimization problems uh, because uh, um, there is a common issue in solving optimization problems. Um, that is, uh, the, the solution can be easily trapped at some uh, local uh, minima without actually finding the global minimum to this, uh, uh, to, to this uh, solution. For example, taking Hopfield network as an example, uh, which uh, solves the uh, optimization problem in uh, uh, energy space. So the system can be trapped at some local minima of the energy without actually reaching the lowest energy. So if we can incorporate chaos into the system, it can help the net network get out of the local minima and uh, continually evolving to the global minimum. But we want to avoid another uh, case that is uh, the system is uh, persistently chaotic so that it may have a convergence problem. So the uh, best case is to have a transient chaos. So in the initial stage, we use uh, chaos to search in the solution space and uh, the chaos can get weakened over time. Eventually it can stabilize the, after finding the global minimum. So this is the overall idea of a transiently chaotic uh, network, which we have uh, experimentally uh, implemented on a memristor crossbar. So the memristors at the diagonal positions are used to uh, control the cell feedback to the Hopfield neurons, which decide if the neuron is in chaotic state or stabilized state. So we can see um, by based on this um, uh, mechanism, so each of the neurons in the network is a transiently chaotic neuron. So initially it is chaotic, and after uh, over time it enters the stabilized stage, uh, which uh, allows the network dynamics to be tuned according to uh, the uh, 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 on demand. And also the memristors in the rest of the positions of the array are used to describe the problem. So we have a. Uh, uh, incorporated this idea into a solution of uh, two typical types of uh, problems. One is a continuous function optimization. That is to find the minimum to the uh, uh, mathematical functions. Um, uh, so without going into too many details, um, so we have tried on two, deep, two uh, mathematical functions uh, experimentally, and uh, the network can automatically find the solution to these uh, problems. Uh, another problem, uh, which is also very typical, is uh, combinatorial optimization problems. Uh, so uh, once again, we uh, map the problem onto the memristor uh, array, and uh, we let, let the network to evolve by itself. Uh, of course, we set the uh, uh, initial uh, state of the um, array, and uh, eventually the array can uh, successfully find the solution to this problem. Uh, this is uh, uh, shows the uh, the uh, successful um, operation of the transiently chaotic network, and uh, we also um, testified uh, the uh, applicability of this idea in a larger scale uh, problem um, by simulation. That is a ten city traveling salesman problem. Uh, once again, it shows a correct solution. Uh, so this is a uh, uh, chaos is uh, the typical. Uh, example of the uh, nonlinear dynamics that uh, uh, once again is a uh, uh, example of uh, utilizing the uh, dynamics in memristor can be uh, helpful for, for uh, achieving efficient uh, computing. So in addition to these different forms of uh, uh, both uh, spatial temporal and nonlinear dynamics, we can actually dig into the intrinsic stochasticity of memristors for some uh, certain applications. So the first example is uh, uncertainty uh, quantification. Um, the present uh, research on, uh, say, uh, in-memory computing architecture, in many cases, it is to develop um, some uh, ASICs. And uh, after training, these ASICs can perform uh, inference on, on a certain uh, inputs uh, with high uh, speed and the high accuracy. This is what we want from, uh, from this uh, in-memory computing-based uh, uh, ASIC. Uh, but there, is a, there could be a 
serious problem uh, with this uh, approach. Um, that uh, is, uh, what if we will have uh, some inputs that is never uh, trained on this ASIC? So uh, as an example, so if, uh, for example, uh, the network is only trained uh, uh, for sunflowers, uh, but never uh, trained on, on a lion. So if uh, the network sees a lion, then uh, in many cases, it will still give us a uh, gives an output um, based on the best similarity. But this is, will cause a serious problem. Uh, so the ideal case is that uh, we want the network to not only give a uh, output, to not only give a result, but uh, at the same time, it should also give a confidence level. So if the confidence level is very low, we should not trust the output at all. So this is uh, uh, the story about uncertainty quantification because the network can be very uncertain about the output. So um, instead of uh, giving an uh, uncertain answer, um, the network should uh, just uh, simply give, I don't know, which is actually a better answer. So some, uh, uh, there is an ancient uh, Chinese sage, uh, Confucius also said, right? Um, so if you don't know a thing, you should uh, simply say, I don't know. So uh, simply being aware of um, the answers, either you know about the answer or uh, don't know about the answer is also a level of uh, intelligence, is maybe also a, a higher level of intelligence. So this is about uh, uncertainty quantification, with, which is actually very, uh, which is actually, I, I think it's a, uh, indispensable, it's very important for reliable AI uh, computing. So uh, there is uh, some uh, recent efforts in, in, in the neural network itself to capture this kind of uh, uncertainty quantification, for example, using SDE net. So this SDE net contains many two types of uh, blocks. One is a prediction net, the other is a diffusion net. So the prediction net is used to do uh, conventional classification. The Confusion, a diffusion net is, is used to capture this type of uncertainty. So um, both nets can be um, further decomposed into two fundamental uh, blocks or, or two types of layers. One is a conven convolutional layer, which is similar with a normal CNN. Uh, it asks for a multi-level conductance from the memory star. The other is a stochastic layer. This is essential for uh, describing the uncertainty quantification. So in, uh, compared with the uh, CNN implementation, here we need to achieve both a multi-level conductance state and stochastic uh, uh, characteristics within the same type of devices. So this is actually a higher demand on the device performance. So we, uh, in order to modulate the device uh, performance and uh, make it suitable for the application, um, we, we actually testified this idea uh, in PCM, uh, phase change uh, memory uh, device. And uh, they can modulate this uh, uh, multi-level conductance and uh, stochasticity um, by physically by the uh, size of the heater that is a bottom electrode. Because the size of the heater eventually decides the uh, volume of the phase, phase change material that participates in the phase transition during the resistance switching. So this is a, a physical dimension that we can use to tune the device characteristics. So overall, we found that um, the four nanometer heater size, uh, that is a larger heater size, generally uh, gives better uh, conductance distribution. Uh, this conductance di distribution not only includes the distribution uh, once after the programming, but also includes the conductance distribution over time because PCM has a fundamental conductance drift problem. So this is due to the, the rela relaxation of the uh, phase uh, over time after programming. So in order to get nice uh, conductance distribution, we need to look at not only uh, the uh, distribution right after programming, but also it's a distribution over time. So, a four nanometer device generally gives better distribution 
uh, throughout the uh, uh, the application of the of the device, uh, and also each state of the conductance uh, can can give a nice distribution, uh, generally a Gaussian distribution that can be used to capture the uncertainty. So based on this uh, uh, simultaneous uh, multi-level and uh, stochastic behavior of the PCM array, we can successfully achieve uncertainty quantification, um, which is uh, based upon the, once again, the physical quantities of the device itself. So for in-distribution data, that is uh, data uh, included in training, it gives a clear answer, a single classification result that gives the highest uh, probability to one class that uh, represents the classification result. But for out of distribution data uh, that the network is unsure, it will give low probability for all, all of the cases. So overall compared with the conventional CNN like ResNet, the, the uncertainty quantification network based on PCM gives a much better uh, classification accuracy for out of distribution data while keeping roughly the same uh, performance on in distribution data. So this is once again based on the stochasticity of the uh, PCM uh, device. Um, another application of the stochasticity is for training because there is an interesting study showing that the carbon dioxide emission uh, when training a network model like a transformer can be five times of the carbon dioxide emission um, of a car in its uh, uh, lifetime uh, emission, including both the manufacturing and the lifetime fuel usage. So which is a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, carbon dioxide emission and al also a lot of uh, energy consumption. So the uh, reason is that uh, the DNA is trained by a back propagation uh, algorithm. Uh, so in order to update the uh, the weight uh, in the intermediate layers, we have to transport the output error layer by layer to each of the intermediate neurons and update all the weight parameters. So this will cause uh, a large time and energy uh, consumption. This will cause a, a weight transport problem, uh, sometimes a weight uh, vanishing problem. Uh, this can also uh, uh, decide that uh, each of the weight in the middle layer is related to all of the parameters uh, in the uh, deep layers. So in order to address this problem, there is some uh, recently some interesting uh, development uh, at the algorithm level called the direct feedback alignment, which allows to train the uh, uh, network uh, by directly uh, uh, performing uh, the error computing uh, from the output directly to the inimitic in intermediate layers. So without going through uh, the layers in between. So uh, another interesting point is that uh, the matrix used to compute the error is uh, only a random matrix, which is uh, instead of the symmetric weight matrix uh, during the forward propagation. So this is, uh, I think is a very interesting uh, progress in the uh, algorithm itself. So. Um, inspired by this, we have uh, uh, further simplified this algorithm. We can actually merge this uh, random matrix into a single random matrix because it only includes random numbers so that it doesn't hurt to merge them into a bigger array which can accommodate all of the random matrix. We can also uh, move this uh, error computing uh, into the uh, uh, memory store device and use the uh, uh, stochasticity of the memory device uh, as uh, 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 the random uh, the parameters in the random matrix. So this is a generally a hardware and algorithm co-design approach. So at the physical uh, at the physical level, we use a randomness in uh, a memory store. Uh, in this case, as a PCM to generate the random weights. Um, at the algorithm level, we merge all the uh, separate matrix into a uh, a large matrix so that it can replace these uh, separate um, weight parameters. So eventually we can accelerate this uh, uh, training process, this error uh, computing process. We testify this idea on two CNN models, uh, uh, Lunet 5, which is a small scale CNN, and a VGG 16, which is a 
seen at larger scale. So um, simply um, performing the uh, algorithm on top of these uh, uh, models, it can get uh, roughly uh, the same performance compared with uh, uh, back propagation. However, there is a, a problem, uh, once again, the conductance drift problem uh, with related to these PCM cells. Because after programming, the conductance will drift over time so that uh, the random distribution of the device can also shift, which can actually affect the error computing process. Um, but this conductance drift can be well described by a, a drift model. So we can uh, experimentally, we can uh, compensate this co conductance drift. So the first idea is to multiply this output result with a time-related uh, uh, coefficient so that we can correct this conductance drift. The second uh, idea is that we can use a differential pair of PCM cells to represent the random weight uh, because um, we expect that uh, the uh, a similar conductance drift can cancel with each other so that result in a stabilized conductance over time. The third approach is uh, certainly is to, is to sample the actual conductance of the uh, array after programming and uh, correct the uh, update the, the mean value of the array and uh, get a, a calibrated random matrix after uh, during the error propagating process. So all these uh, three approaches can get a similar performance. But the first, um, the uh, slope correction uh, approach will uh, need to perform very frequent uh, computing on the output result so that it, it is very computing intensive. A differential pair approach will cost uh, like a, a double-sized array uh, so that in this sense, the uh, mean update uh, approach is actually very uh, economic because uh, it is only um, uh, requiring a single array and the update doesn't need to be uh, performed very frequently. So, um, so the result is that uh, uh, using this uh, uh, direct feedback alignment, uh, using the um, uh, stochasticity of PCM for computing, we can accelerate the training process, uh, which is about uh, three times in terms of both energy and the time consumption compared with uh, accelerated uh, BP training in hardware. Uh, so the last part, because I, I think I have used uh, uh, too much time. Uh, so the last part is that uh, um, about, uh, we recently um, tried to incorporate some of the devices uh, into the chip design and uh, 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 try to uh, push it to uh, the application level. Uh, to design a, a in-memory computing chip, um, there may be four aspects that is very important. One is the encoding of the inputs uh, including both uh, the pulse number, uh, the pulse width or amplitude can all be used to encode the uh, input information. The cell construction is very important uh, because it um, uh, decides the, uh, the previous uh, characteristics that we mentioned uh, uh, important for, for inference like a, a variation. Uh, the third one is about sensing scheme including both current and voltage sensing and uh, uh, the last one, of course, is about the ADC because uh, uh, basically the memory surface in memory computing is a computing in the analog domain. Well, the circuit is usually digital. So the conversion between digital and analog is, uh, is indispensable. And this is all, um, in many cases, is a bottleneck of, uh, of the chip itself. So recently we have designed uh, two um, uh, in memory computing chips. One is uh, uh, based on uh, uh, computing chip that only incorporates a uh, uh, sense amplifier as the uh, a one bit ADC as the uh, 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 as a readout circuit. So this is used to uh, optimize the, the force point uh, in the circuit design. Uh, it includes about a one megabit memory cell and it can support different neural network models. And recently we have designed a, a bigger chip to accommodate a more advanced uh, ResNet. Uh, uh, models and um, uh, has a pipeline structure so that it is a full chip instead of uh, a macro. So both uh, chips have been taped out and hopefully I will show, be able to show some uh, experimental results very soon uh, in the future. So um, due to the time limitation, I think uh, I have uh, already spent uh, so, so, so used uh, too much time. So I want to stop here and uh, 
uh, uh, I want to thank the funding agencies and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yang. That's very comprehensive talk. I find it's very uh, exciting. That's, uh, so uh, now the uh, the talk is open for questions. So any questions, feel free that either you want to type it in the chat box, I can ask it on your behalf, or you feel free to like, so open, let me switch on your microphone and ask yourself as well. I think usually it takes some time to warm up. I think I can follow the first question. So for the last part, even though you just uh, very brief, at uh, talking about energy efficiency. So uh, I know there's always really pre very the preliminary stage. So what, what kind of, uh, uh, what, what kind of order of magnitude are we expecting that for the current design? I mean, for your in-memory uh, computer chip design? Okay, um, if we design it to, do, uh, of course, it's a simulation resource. Uh, we design it to be about uh, 50 tops per watt, um, but uh, we, we, we are still waiting for uh, the testing results. So hopefully we can we can target a, a high energy efficiency. Okay, good. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, so sure. There's only design stage. I totally understand. I think yeah. I think there's one question from the floor from Neil. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, so uh, uh, what what do you think about the new morphic computing based on the superconducting Johns uh, Josephson's uh, junction? If I spell it correctly, I think it's Johnson Junction. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, I, I'm, I may have to apologize here because I'm not very familiar with this topic. So <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but uh, I, I never uh, carefully uh, look into this, uh, this subject. So uh, maybe we can, we can uh, discuss offline after I, I, I search some of the, uh, and read some of the papers on, on this. Okay, so no problem. I think that's, oh, I think that he asked another question. Oh, here she does as well. So uh, which direction is more perspicuous? I mean, that we think will be better for the okay. neuromorphic <clears throat> computing, say to study the computing or to study the biological neurons or the brain or the learning, very broad question, I guess. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. So I think um, to uh, uh, study neuromorphic computing, um, then we have to uh, have a bridge uh, so um, that can uh, get uh, correct or uh, useful inspiration from neuroscience or from the brain science and uh, use it to empower uh, neuromorphic computing. So one of the uh, important bridges, uh, I think, is uh, computational neuroscience. Um, I do not think uh, it is a practical approach to uh, uh, emulate and uh, to um, try to reproduce all the biological uh, features uh, from the neuron or from the synapse uh, into the computing system, into the computing hardware. So a more practical approach uh, might be to uh, uh, convert the uh, biological details into a computational model. Uh, this can be done by computational neuroscience, which is a very important uh, subject, of course. And the, the role of this uh, layer or the, uh, the role of this uh, interface um, is to convert the details into abstract or uh, into the models that uh, a computing scientists can understand or can, can try to implement in hardware. So I think this is a very important uh, uh, layer, this very important uh, uh, interface um, uh, to bridge uh, the brain and science uh, and uh, use it to uh, use it uh, by, by electrical engineers for neuromorphic computing. So to be short, I think uh, the mathematical description of the uh, biological uh, details is very important. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, one question from Joe here. That's, uh, thanks for your excellent talk. So mm -hmm. uh, I have a question that's, uh, so does the VO2 uh, selector have the sufficient on-off ratio okay. yeah. for the spiking neurons? So okay. what is the advantage of uh, that, I think MBO2 and the VO2 selector separately? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's a good point. So for the uh, vanadium oxide selector, um, uh, according to our experience, a uh, more important ratio is a ratio between the uh, threshold voltage 
at the uh, holding voltage. So the threshold voltage is a, is a point that triggers the switching from off to on state. And the holding voltage is uh, where the device gets back to the uh, off state because this margin actually designs the amplitude of the oscillation. And of course, this can be, uh, this can be uh, optimized by a material growth and uh, um, uh, so from other results, we have shown that uh, uh, there, is a, there is a pretty good margin uh, allowing us to uh, pursue applications. So the second part of this question is about uh, the com comparison between niobium oxide and uh, vanadium oxide, right? So, so these are two similar materials, but they are different, uh, I think, uh, uh, the major difference is uh, uh, phase transition temperature. So niobium oxide has a much higher transition temperature, uh, like uh, 700 or 800 degree uh, Celsius. Uh, the vanadium oxide has a much lower uh, trans transition temperature with about 60, 70 uh, uh, degree Celsius. So the, um, uh, to me, I think uh, uh, the uh, uh, advantage of niobium oxide is that uh, uh, the higher temperature is uh, uh, is a uh, is a more stable uh, in the sense that uh, it is not uh, it it will not be um, switched let's say by some 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 thermal effect or some you know, not real signals um, but the advantage of vanadium oxide um, according to our experience as uh, it can give better uniformity of course we we didn't try to uh, optimize the uh, uh, crystalline structure of niob niobium oxide, but uh, we we found uh, it is doable to optimize vanadium oxide. Uh, so I, I hope that answers your question. Is that uh, niobium oxide has a higher uh, temperature, uh, but of course it caused uh, uh, maybe a higher uh, power consumption, um, and uh, it is more stable. Uh, vanadium oxide uh, uh, seems to have a better performance after uh, optimization on the material growth. Okay. So uh, there's a one question from the Kompon. Uh, it's uh, so how do you do the the, the back propagation? This is changing the ways of the Marista during the training of the neural network. Oh, what's that? I, I didn't see that. Is it from the- Oh, so this is a private question. So I think uh, he just said, oh, he or she sent it to me directly. So okay. I, yeah. I can type okay. it here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you read the question once again? Because I'm yeah, sorry. So ah. uh, he wanted to ask about uh, how do you do the, the back propagation? So okay. that's is the changing the weighting of the Marista during the training of the neural network. Uh, how, to, how to do it, right? Yes, like by changing the weighting of the Marista during the training of the neural network. Okay, so so this is a um, um, how say that. So um, the back propagation is a uh, um, is a mature uh, uh, mathematics based uh, a training algorithm. Basically, we, we compute the error based on the BP algorithm and use it to update the uh, state of the memory store. But I well, uh, I think what you ask is that uh, how to do it during the direct uh, feedback alignment. So uh, in this case, um, similarly, we will get uh, the uh, error information uh, after the forward uh, propagation. Um, and uh, according to the detailed uh, uh, loss functions or uh, anyway, we, we will get the error. So after getting the error, we multiply this error with a, a random matrix uh, so that it will uh, compute the uh, it will uh, also give the um, update that we need to perform on the uh, intermediate parameters. So in this sense, it is only one simple multiplication um, between the output vector and the random matrix so that we will get the uh, updating amount uh, that needs to be applied to the, to the weights uh, in the intermediate layers. Uh, I guess that's what what you ask for, right? Yeah, I assume so. That's a thing. So, uh, any other question from the floor? Oh, I think that's a very a long one. I, I guess uh, I, I just want to make sure I didn't miss that part. I think Neil asked another question. Probably you can also see that one. Okay. I think. 
uh, I think it's he's also very uh, curious about like the why the quantum computing seems to attract more attention <laughs> from the business than the neuromorphic computing, <laughs> based on his uh, or her that observation. Even though the quantum computing is still in a very fundamental or like infant stage, stage. I mean, the scientists are still trying to make more qubits in the quantum computing. Well, it's more like the philosophical question. That's I mean, that's uh, why the quantum computing looks like attract more attention than the new morphics. Okay, I, I don't uh I, I don't know. So uh I I don't think I have a, uh uh I, I have the position to comment on these two <laughs> <laughs> technologies. I know uh it is a uh, uh, very competitive uh in the US, the quantum computing and the new morphic computing always fight with each other and uh, fight for the grant, uh, fight for the funding. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, now it's clear. It's okay. A little so, bit hiccup now. Is yes. it? Uh, well, it looks like it's a little bit uh, hiccup. So, was it Yang is still here? I guess you can try to switch off the camera or maybe stop sharing if it helps. Uh, yeah, okay. I think for Professor Yao, it's. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now it's clear. Yeah, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so. okay. <laughs> Sorry about this. I don't know uh, what happened today. So, okay. Uh, so, uh, regarding the previous question about uh, neuromorphic and uh, quantum computing, um, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I, I uh, learned that uh, there is a uh, intense compu competition in the U.S. between uh, neuromorphic and quantum computing. So when you apply for uh, grants for funding, uh, these two groups always uh, fight with each other. So, uh, but uh, uh, anyway, so I think um, from an application perspective. Uh, um, uh, quantum computing, um, I, I don't work on that, so that uh, I, I don't have a right to say, but it seems to be more distant uh, for application. And uh, neuromorphic uh, seems to be more uh, realistic and uh, practical uh, in a short term. So that is what, what my, uh, my opinion. Right, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. Yeah. okay good. So, uh... I think there's another question is from Andy, I guess, from Andy Call. So I think he saw some of the Marista in the market. I think maybe, uh, well, you probably can see that one as well. Is there any yeah. starting kit yeah. to learn more about the Marista? Yeah, so yes, there is some uh, Marista available in the market. So I think you can directly buy it from Amazon or, or, oh, okay. uh, or somewhere, uh, or, or some um, other websites. But, uh, uh, yes, I think uh, uh, as long as it sells a product, it, it will have a have a manual, right, to to introduce how to how to use these type of devices. But uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, doing experiments on the um, uh, memristors sold in the market, you can also easily build um, mm -hmm. a, a memristor by yourself because it has a very simple structure, and the material is also uh, quite mature because. Uh, Generally, the community has uh, converged to uh, two or three major materials right now, mm -hmm. like hafnium oxide or tesla oxide, which have a demonstrated high performance. So yes, I think it's very uh, convenient to, to start working on Memristar and uh, welcome to join this community. Yep, good, that's very good, thanks. Okay, so uh, let's see if I miss any question. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a very interesting talk and very exciting opportunity. So, well, well, I think that's obvious based on the attendance. This is one of the highest one what we have had for our the distinguished lecture series. So, thanks for I'm sure that's a very excellent uh, uh, opportunity and also a very interesting talk. So, thanks, Professor Yang, for uh, for your talk, and I hope that we all enjoyed it. And uh, so, uh, I think that's how uh, we look forward to more exciting uh, results in the near future. So, uh, stay tuned. So, thanks a lot for joining us today. Have a good uh, weekend. So thank you, Professor Yang, again.
Okay, so have a good, have a good weekend. See you guys. Thank you, Bye bye.